thank you for joining us. My name is Nikki Wallace. Um, I'm a multiple hat wearer person, researcher, designer, writer, facilitator. Um, my work straddles three different um, areas, a living lab, a design practice and a university. Now, um, I know Jax has just done um, an acknowledgement of country. I'm zooming in from unceded Ghana land, and I'd like to also pay my respects to Ghana elders past, present and emerging, and to acknowledge their connection to land, water and culture, not only because it's important that we make these acknowledgements, but also because my work benefits so much um, from and draws upon so much Indigenous knowledge, and I'm incredibly grateful for what's been shared with me over the years. So. Um, it's really influenced my thinking, my ways of working, my ways of being, um, particularly when I talk about participation. So um, that's what I'm focused on tonight. I'm going to give you a, a bit of an overview of what we do um, in the Living Lab, Net Zero Lab, um, mainly because participation is fundamental um, to how we operate. But then I'm going to really hone in on a particular project called Food Futures, um, which is really looking at participation in a pandemic um, and how we've responded in the lab to the restrictions that COVID placed on, on how we could do um, participatory work. So we are a living lab. Um, and for anyone unfamiliar with that term, I'll give you a bit of a, a quick overview of what that means for us. Basically, living labs are, are fundamentally participatory places. Um, we aim to experiment with real people in the real world. Um, and that means living labs as both spaces and collectives of humans are also really agile and reflective. So we're actually an incorporated collective of nine people. Um, we've got a horizontal org structure. We use self-management principles. We're working towards a future that includes co-budgeting. Um, so that will be exciting um, because we basically believe that we shouldn't have to compromise our values to pay our bills. Um, so the whole idea of the lab is a, as a collective is that it will provide us all with really meaningful futures focused work that pays us all a living wage. Um, so we focus on three main problem spaces, consumption and waste, food security and education. And our core purpose um, in the lab is to co-create viable collective futures for a carbon conscious world. So by nature, that really means that we engage in very social processes. So we work with people, not for people. We build relationships first and projects last. And what we've found is that the projects that emerge from those relationships tend to be the ones that have the kinds of legs that are needed to go the distance. And so that can also be really slow. And so underpinning that idea is the idea that we move at the speed of trust. So we bring our whole selves to those processes and that also brings a kind of warts and all um, level of vulnerability with it. So um, what we found is that that vulnerability attracts trust. So vulnerability in wholeness is something that we're practicing as a lab. Um, systems and transi transitions work is really messy. Um, and anyone who's kind of in that space will, will know that immediately. It's often really uncomfortable um, for things to be in flux. So as part of what we do with this work is we really try and embrace that complex and unknownness about things. And I think, you know, part of that discomfort is having this sense of urgency, but really resisting the urge to rush. That's a, a weird kind of paradox to, to sort of hold. So um, I think it's, it's rare to get the satisfaction of knowing um, in this space and it's rare to get the satisfaction of finishing systems work the way you do with normal uh, design projects. So I feel like we're just kind of chipping away at these really big existential problems and that's a little bit like wearing the itchy cardigan that your nana knitted for you. Uh, you've got to find ways of sitting in the discomfort and the itchiness knowing that it's going to keep you warm. And then there are these crises, uh, so many crises. I'll focus on two. Um, so we have the one uh, fast crisis and the one slow crisis. And so Tony Fry calls the fast crisis the pandemic and the slow crisis the, cli uh, the crisis of climate change. And he describes how these crises really suspend the future, they unsettle our trajectory, they upset all our plans. And from a systems change perspective, all of that unsettling actually poses all of these um, different potential ways forward. None of them involve a return to normal, no matter how much we yearn for that. And so what we really need to do is kind of grieve what we've lost and surrender to this discomfort, to this unknownness. And that, um, that experience really unsettled the lab in a heap of different ways, not least of which was financially. We lost all of our funding um, and all of our potential funding. And we had to decide whether uh, to pause or to push on. 
as a collective, we decided to see what we could do without funding. And so part of what we felt we needed in order to do that was really elastic imaginations. We've spent quite a bit of time during the pandemic remapping a lot of the problem spaces that we work in, like consumption of waste and food security, through the lens of the pandemic. Um, and we've begun rallying with people to imagine different ways that we could intervene in these problems. So when the pandemic hit, we were actually mid-engagement in the Flurio Peninsula or Patanga in um, Ghana language. And so Patanga is a, a peri-urban food region. It's about two hours um, south of Adelaide. And the region has heaps of lovely wineries and tourist destinations and is a huge producer of food. And that was really the focus of our work there. So the research that we'd already conducted was starting to show us that there were these competing, competing narratives around what it meant to thrive in the food system and what it meant to be part of a thriving food system. And adding to that complexity were these competing narratives around what shopping local means, shopping at my local supermarket or shopping for locally grown produce at the local farmer's market. And so one of the questions we kept returning to was whether or not these competing narratives were starting to create a food desert. Um, and that's basically a, a, a situation where the food that's grown locally is exported and the food that's consumed locally is imported. And so we started to wonder what it would take to intervene in that kind of problem. So about um, two or three years ago, 2018, towards the end of 2018, um, I became part of a collaborative working group, which included an ex-crop farmer, a food entrepreneur, a blockchain expert, myself and another transitions researcher, um, a water researcher and a social marketer. And we'd begun exploring the food system together, mapping, backcasting, surfacing tensions, searching for regional success stories. And we use a heap of different mapping techniques to explore all of these different aspects of the food system. So in this one, we're, we're looking at um, the system as a multi-level perspective, looking at the different structural levels of, of the food system and how they play out within the norms of everyday life. And then looking to identify some intervention points that might actually help us mobilize a transition pathway to something more regenerative. And so we looked at all of these different dimensions of farming and food um, in the region. We did a steep analysis. We found all of these unexpected problems within the system that we felt were, were probably pretty invisible to most people other than those that were directly impacted by them. So we started to look at every single food system stakeholder in the region. We started to look at how they were, were connected and, and mapped their indirect and direct relationships to get a sense of where all of the interconnections were. And it looks bananas, but it really started to show us how complex all of the relationships between people in food systems really are. So we also did some visions and backcasting work to start to look for intervention points and to think about the kind of project constellation that could support a transition in the space. And one of the big things that we recognised was um, that a, a food hub could play a really different role for stakeholders um, in terms of creating reciprocity and, and opportunities for more participatory engagement with the food system. So we started looking at the different roles um, that would be played by the stakeholders um, at very everyday sorts of interaction levels. So things like growing food, transporting food, selling, consuming, even wasting food, all of the different habits and daily practices um, that, that each group had. And we started to think about, again, where we might be able to intervene. And capacity building, uh, really struck us as a, a significant piece of work in this space. So really encouraging collaboration and participation requires skills that not everyone in the system has. So we knew we needed um, a, a, a big sort of hefty whole of systems kind of approach that would involve as many different people as possible. Um, so we pitched an engagement process that was based on co-creation, co-research, co-mapping. Uh, we pitched that through to the mayor, to the local councils, to um, local agribusiness leadership groups. We got everyone's support and booked in six weeks of rolling workshops. Um, we developed a whole bunch of different materials based on social learning processes. Um, and basically we're, we're looking at continuing to map the food system from lots of different perspectives. So we designed these really deliberately simple canvases to invite people into the process and to explore the everydayness of food. And I often describe 
being in systems, sort of like being a fish in the water. You don't know or really recognize the water. It's just there and you just swim because that's what fish do. And I think systems are a bit like that. So some of the activities that, that we pull together in these spaces start to reveal the water. So the discovery process happens at a very personal level so that people can see themselves in the system before they see the actual system. And then they can start to imagine what their role might be in that system in the future. So after we've been through those processes, we do a whole heap of more, uh, a whole heap of other sense making work in the lab using another layer of canvases. And that helps us to just unpack the social learning and, and merge all of the different insights from multiple workshops and report back the collective views of the system. And we plot a lot of the, um, the emergent pathway um, projects using some analysis tools that help us to just map the initiatives against these markers um, of systems change. We've got these 36 kinds of characteristics of change that, that we start to look at. Um, and I basically spent the half of my PhD sort of setting down the foundations for all of this work, um, you know, developing relationships and building trust and, and, you know, founding the lab. And then the pandemic hit and I had to kind of rethink that entire process because it was so in person and personal. Um, thankfully, I didn't do that alone. But the big question became, how do we do what we do when we can't do what we do? Um, and so the initial knee jerk response was oh, Miro, quick, Zoom, Miro, everything online. Um, and we sketched out what a Miro space might look like to mimic what the, you know, the, the World Cafe style of workshop might look like. And then we really rapidly realized how many different ways that would completely fail for this project. Um, not only because um, of the, the, the whole of system sort of approach, um, meaning a lot of people in this space, but a lot of these people are from rural areas, they um, work with their hands, not with computers, so there are limited computer skills, some technophobia um, uh, uh, feelings in the mix, and often very weak internet connections. So online was kind of ruled out. So we started to think about cultural probes. Um, and our initial thought was this could be something, but then we thought about cultural probes and, and the, the sort of extractive nature of them um, and felt like it would kind of fail um, as a data collection technique, you know, that aims for co-research. It, it wasn't quite there. We really wanted to play up that idea of interactivity and, and felt that that was really crucial. So, you know, yeah, we'd capture data, but that rich, warm data that happens through relationship. Um, through bouncing off of one another in a space, all of that would be missing. So we kind of reimagined um, the cultural probe as something less extractive. Um, you know, what would happen if we could reimagine it to be generative? And so we started developing these different ideas of um, ways that we could package up a workshop into a box. And we imagine this process kind of like a pass the parcel that would allow the box and all of the rich warm data inside of it to move between participants in the community to facilitate the interaction between people's ideas, even if lockdowns and social distancing meant that people themselves couldn't interact. So the first prototype was a bunch of fold out posters that were stitched together like a workshop. Uh, sorry, like a workbook um, that we could use for co-mapping. And we really quickly realised that that wasn't quite going to cut the mustard. Um, and we came back to the drawing board. And in coming back to the drawing board, we started to accidentally come up with new ideas for what the probe could be. And so we started to imagine this process um, as a game. And we started to think about what would happen if we played games with people in this community and, and how could the co-creation of a capacity building game be played in a number of different ways. And that idea kind of folded back in on itself, which completely redirected the design of, of the cultural probe. Um, and so we ended up with a series of boxes with slightly different activities that all build on one another to eventually create the game. And so the poster book was reimagined as these large format boards that kind of folded up in ways that mimic game boards. So they would all fit inside the box. And we got quietly excited about, you know, this game board style and how it could act like a teaser um, of the end outcome and really give people a sense of where the process was heading, even if it was a little bit like an Easter egg. Um, but we felt like we were starting to use some of the mechanics of gameplay um, in the process. And we got quite excited about that. So the first prototype that we did was so scrappy, um, but like all good underdog stories, 
has a happy ending um, because it taught us a lot about the process that we were designing and we started to to really test the idea out whether the boards needed to be blank or whether they needed to be preceded with some stickies um, and ultimately we we edited the artwork on the boards just to include some little prompts for people so that there was a bit of inspiration um, to draw from if you were the the first person receiving the, the, the parcel or the kit. Now finding suppliers to work on us, uh, work with us on the game boards was almost impossible. We actually had about a three month lull in the project, just trying to find a supplier to help us produce um, the kits. We had three printers turn down the project entirely. Um, we had another one that took two months just to quote on it. Um, and that essentially came down to the cut and fold technique um, and the size that that seemed to be what most people kind of hung up on. Um, I knew a packaging supplier could do the job um, and, and we could get into sort of specialty territory, but I really didn't fancy spending thousands of dollars on what was effectively still a prototype, uh, because in my mind, this was still prototype stage. Um, so we found a framer, a picture framer that was willing to do um, a prototype, but what they actually did was miscut and fold. Um, so they, they did a different cut and fold technique that, that didn't match our specs. So we don't actually have in this prototype that physical interaction, that mimicking um, of, a, of a board game um, that we were hoping for, but it still works as a, a, a a pass the parcel um, data collection um, process and co-research process. So we started to test a lot of different materials along the way. So this is three different, um, three different versions. Basically, we were looking for the sweet spot for cost, weight, structural integri uh, integrity, sustainability, and um, the feel, the, the interaction. And so the first prototype um, on the far left is the only one that's no longer moving around the community. All of the other ones are of variable, some questionable quality, um, but they're working, um, they function. So we're keeping them moving, even though we're not 100% um, happy with the finish of them all, they're, they're doing their job. Um, so when we were testing that first prototype, we started to really get a sense of where the limits of participation were. Um, we were learning that people were really yearning to come together, even if it was in small groups. And we saw that, you know, what we had designed was a process for participa participation in what I call together but alone kinds of ways. Um, and what we really needed to think about was how we could maybe bring people together in small groups in their homes to self-facilitate the process. Um, and that, that started to change the process itself because we had merged different activities into the boxes. So, you know, a card game with some, some game boards. Um, and what we found was in small groups, that completely blew the time out. Um, and so, so we really needed to think about a rearrangement of the activities and a rethink in terms of the timing of everything. And that process really allowed us to kind of um, evolve the cards and the way that we were playing the cards. So the card set component was basically a role playing game that asked people to adopt a persona and to respond to an unfolding um, scenario or crisis as that person. And so the aim of the game was really to develop empathy skills um, and to build the adaptive capacity of the players. And so we started to introduce some small gameplay elements. There were some, some dice moves. You, know, you could roll a dice and pick up a new skill um, or, or change roles within the community. And so people had the capacity to, to change how they would respond. And then we also started to think about journaling and giving people a way of actually capturing their thoughts and how they felt um, when they were going through these experiences. So we um, had some, some little journal booklets. We also included just some loose leaf pages that people could respond on so that they could, um, if they were alone, share their moves with others. Um, and if they were together, they could just use them to jot down their thoughts along the way. Now, this part of the game also includes blank cards that invite people to add themselves into the card set. So the intention with this was that over time, we would collate um, a very community specific set of personas, skills, community roles, leadership roles. So the game could essentially go back into the community with um, all of its content based on real people, real roles, real skills from that community. 
And the intention there was that it could be used for future co-creation, not to take the place of engagement with people, but to amplify it and expand upon it. And so as part of the reshuffle of the boards and the cards, we had to come back in and revisit all of the prompts um, in the guidebook and all of the prompts on the boards themselves. And so I started coming through all of the material and, and speaking with, um, with former participants on the phone and getting a sense of, you know, what was it like? What would you change? And really responding to the feedback that we were getting from people around their experience of, um, of playing. And we offered a helpline, um, which no one called, <laughs> but every single time we spoke with people about feedback, we got comments like, I really wished you were here to ask questions when we were playing the card game, or I would have loved to get your guidance on this board. So the big question for us then became, well, how do we help when we can't even see where or when help is needed? And so the guidebook, again, became um, a point of focus for us. And we, what we were really trying to do here was strike a balance between to play and engage and how much is actually just steering thinking too much. So we really wanted to kind of amplify um, the generative um, aspect of the project and, and give provocations rather than um, directions. And even if the response to those provocations was, I don't know, that was fine. That, that's a valid response. So we weren't expecting um, more or less than what people were willing um, to give. Uh, but we started to wonder if we needed more, you know, did we need an intro video so that people could see, you know, a friendly, a friendly face and and hear um, the words rather than read information, particularly guiding points like there's no right or wrong way to answer. If you don't know how to respond, you don't have to respond. And um, some of those reassurances are friendlier and warmer when they're spoken rather than written. So the next big question was, how unhuman is this participation becoming? And is it still a warm process of social learning? And if it's not, how can we ensure that the richness and warmth is still there? And this got us really thinking about other ways of facilitating the process. Um, and so my big provocation here was, what if there was no internet? And I was reminded of um, being about seven or eight in primary school. And we used to have this sing-along session that we did. And the whole class had a singing book in front of them and we would tune into a radio show and we would learn a new song that we would sing together. And so my whole classroom was singing and there were classrooms all over the country that were also singing. And we were all part of this weird dislocated eighties choir. And I started to wonder whether workshop provocations could be run in a similar kind of way. So as goes with this work, the potential for this really kind of blossomed out of a relationship within the community um, that I had with a local DJ who I was introduced to by one of my farming friends. And we hit it off and he interviewed me on his radio show. And so I texted him randomly with my imagine if moment. Um, and it was from that, that this idea about facilitating a food system exploration on his radio show complete with thinking music uh, was kind of was kind of born. Um, now this hasn't actually been executed yet. We're still um, moving through the process of thinking about the nuts and bolts of it. How do we get it to work? But we're seeing opportunities for a phone in capability for q as alongside live tweets and that sort of thing. Um, and so this is really starting to, to kind of play on our minds around um, where this could go outside of um, uh, outside of the boxes. And the boxes, you know, they're slow and my patient's pants are really getting a workout. So I've been very conscious of time and starting to think about how can we speed up time. And so we reimagined the card game component back into a digital context. And we started to imagine how it might be able to be played remotely. So the big problem with digital before was in part bandwidth and ability to participate. And so um, what I started to look at was instead of using things like Mural or Miro to do something completely simple using Google Slides. So we started to do things like create master slides with a little bit of artwork on the top that had simple steps like click on a card to delete it and it will reveal information below. 
um, we started to lock down um, some content which made typing really easy because you would get that click to enter um, text which made responding really simple. We used alphanumeric codes so that we had a proxy for things like rolling the dice and you know different moves would be made based on the letter that you had in the in the top of that um, that square. And so once the cards were revealed people would have an opportunity to think about their person to imagine what they did that day what kept them awake at night what did they dream about or hope for and they would introduce themselves to the group and then the shenanigans would begin so we would pick a scenario and that scenario would change and unfold as the game went on and just you know like in real life you have agency to choose the kinds of roles and skills that you learn so we wanted to mimic that within the game and let people choose and adopt roles and skills of their choosing um and sometimes we let that happen before the crisis escalated and sometimes we let it happen afterwards so people had an opportunity to pick a new skill based on something they could really you know use in a pandemic um and so the, the the crisis would unfold there would be three rounds basically of getting new skills and responding to a crisis and then a moment of reflection afterwards and um what we're starting to see now is the multiple kinds of ways that we can really um, play around with this idea of a workshop in a box so it's a physical thing it's a process um, it's parts of and wholes so it's a, a kind of based on the principles of holacracy in that sense um, and what we're seeing now is these opportunities for it to be um, very analog in terms of this past the parcel mode we're seeing opportunities for it to be digital um, but in a low tech digital kind of way and we're seeing an opportunity for it to be a combination of the two using radio instead of um, internet to, to bring a group together around the activities so the next big question that we're asking is how else and where else could this kind of thing be useful um, and so we're revisiting the kits again in the new year to adapt them for the consumption and waste problem. Um, but we won't do that by ourselves. We're actually doing that within um, a, a, a college called Natu College, which is a new school in Ghana land. Um, it has Aboriginality at its core. Um, and we're gonna do this with students um, as part of a Rethink Rubbish project, which is another project in the lab. Um, so this will really um, you know, bring a, a different group of participants together to reimagine this project process. So I'm quite excited about that. Um, and that's it in a nutshell. That is how we have responded um, to the pandemic by moving things around the community and engaging in participation in a bunch of different ways. So thank you very much for listening. And um, I'm happy to hear any questions if people have questions. Thanks so much, Nikki. So if anyone has questions, um, maybe you can pop them in the, um, in the chat and Nikki can um, answer them, hopefully. Oh, yay, another person who remembers the sing-along books, ABC Sing. <laughs> what were some of the most interesting ideas and outcomes generated? Uh, do you mean by the community um, of people that were responding? Yes, okay. Um, well, <laughs> uh, all of the responses that we've collated so far are actually from people that we've been testing with. So I'm hesitant to answer that question purely because the boxes are still out in the community. They're still collecting um, all of these wonderful ideas. Um, the big ideas that um, people had from the testing rounds, mostly centered around um, creating opportunities for people to participate more in the food system. So opportunities um, to learn more about gardening and growing their own food um, and having really responsive kinds of um, ways of dealing with waste, with food waste. So look what the, the strawberry, um, strawberry gate, I don't know if anyone remembers the, the strawberry scandal from um, late last year, uh, where we had all these needles in strawberries. And that was a bit of a stimulus for one person who was like, we should have made jam. <laughs> um, so It'll be interesting to see whether those kinds of ideas come through from the, the community now that the, the boxes are out there as well. 
um, from Kira around low literacy skills. The um, text that is in um, the booklet has been written relatively simply. Um, what we are missing in that piece are the video um, support structures. So we were looking at whether videos would actually help fill in some of those literacy gaps. And what we're looking at now with the radio show version is whether that can actually play part of that role for us. Um, and we're playing around with um, a, a radio, a live radio show that people you know, tune into and do on the spot um, versus a podcast that you could do um, live with the podcast or download later. So there are a few different options there for people to participate and hear rather than read. Um, Um, from Kelly Ann, so many, almost so many that um, it's hard to, <laughs> to bring up the laundry list. Um, there are um, some very particular um, authors and some very particular literature that's, that's informed the work very closely, um, not least of which um, has been Arturo Escobar's Designs for the Pluriverse and working very closely with ideas of autonomous design. Um, a lot of the um, uh, the more sort of um, convivial processes, we draw a lot on Liz Sanders, so Sanders and Staffer's work, um, uh, playing around with a lot of the, the more convivial um, toolbox sorts of ideas. Um, Kelly, I'm part way through your book, which I'm um, absolutely loving. I think it's a, a really brilliant resource and I'm so grateful to have received that, <laughs> not fishing. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so grateful to have received that midway through the process so that we can really start to think about um, all of these different kinds of ways of, of doing this work and engaging um, with people. Um, and D, ethical partners for printing. Yes, that's a, a really significant um, part of the reason why it was so difficult for us to, to work with um, different print companies. We were limited in terms of who we could ask. Um, everything that we've printed has been printed through a carbon neutral um, printer who are locally based. Um, unfortunately, the, um, the, the big version, the, the real version that's no longer a prototype, um, in order for us to get this game board um, sort of aspect uh, done, we'll use a local printer. There will absolutely be um, zero waste and sustainability considerations in the process there, but we're limited with who we can actually um, contact that can physically go through the process and make it without it breaking. And that was the big sort of disappointment with the, the combination of suppliers that we had with this um, prototyping round was that the combinations weren't quite working. Um, and so the, the people that could do the mounting couldn't necessarily manage the whole process and nor could the people doing the printing. And so we ended up making most of it ourselves. We were so unhappy with what we were getting back from um, from you know the the suppliers that we went. All right, let's just make these in house. And so most of it's been done in my studio. <laughs> and actually, ours have less bubbles. <laughs> Maybe because we spent more time squinching them out. <laughs> So Nikki, um, we've only got a couple more minutes, so maybe if you just want to scan through and just answer one more, and if we want to follow up more, we have more time at the panel discussion to answer other questions. So maybe sure. Like Thank you. Um, I'll just, I'll respond to the question around the participants, because I think that's really um, quite important. We're not hand-picking um, participants for the project. We've put out an open call um, for participation. Um, we have specifically invited um, people from local government, people from um, PERSA, from um, agricultural and agribusiness groups, um, and people from local, particularly local food businesses, um, and farmers. So there have been some very specific choices made around making sure that we're covering off everyone in the system. Um, but as far as the general public um, is concerned, you know, we're going through a consultation pro uh, process with local Aboriginal groups. We're going through a process of the general kind of call um, for participation within the community. And we have a few very passionate, active, engaged people within the community who have offered to just spread the word. Um, which was incredible um, to me. To, I thought I was going to have to do so much legwork to move these boxes around the community. So to have people just get really excited about it and say, 
can I give it to a whole bunch of other people? Um, that's just been so humbling and such a gift because my assumption going in was people won't care enough to participate. And yes, there are people who, who don't want to participate, but there are also on the flip side of that people who are not just willing to participate, but to help drive it literally <laughs> around the community. So that to me is incredible. Um, and, and I'm, I'm, completely dumbfounded by the the um the graciousness and the the generosity um that the community has so um in terms of deciding we're we're not necessarily deciding there's no you know who's in and who's out if you want to participate you can um and we've we're keeping that call open until the middle of next year so that we can try and make sure that we really do um capture as many people as possible in what's um become a relatively slow process, <laughs> much slower than just holding a few workshops.